in this morning for a Pentecostal uh, church. And so you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean? What are the distinctives of being Pentecostal? I gave a number of illustrations. Uh, you can wear Michael Jordan tennis shoes, but that doesn't mean you can hoop. And so uh, uh, I've been through a few of these, and uh, Pentecost represents the power. If you look at Peter before Pentecost, he's cursing, denying even the Lord. After Pentecost, uh, he stands and 3,000 are saved. He stands boldly in the face of the very people, no doubt, some of them, that cried, crucify Jesus. Pentecost represents power. It's the Holy Spirit saturating a human life. Be filled, Jesus said, I want you to tear it. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I as Pentecostal should be sensitive to the Spirit of God. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Paul said. In other words, uh, many times we're fighting temptation and flesh when really we ought to just be surrendering to the Spirit. And that's all the problem. You can't be filled with the Spirit of God. When you are filled, let me put it this way, so many addictions and sins and temptations that before uh, seem to gravitate to you, all of a sudden, when you're filled and walk in the Spirit, uh, that's eliminated. Peter went on, books in the Bible, a couple of books carrying his name, and etc. I want to minister this morning another thought. Uh, about a distinctive of Pentecost. Peter is a picture of Pentecost. Peter is a picture of Pentecost. Acts 3, I want to begin though with verse 1. Now, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Fixing his eyes on him, when John Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. What I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want you to rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So this man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon, in great amazement. Father, we come by the blood, by the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray God you move this morning in signs and wonders and miracles. I pray God you heal people, deliver people, break curse and devour. God, I pray the Spirit of the living God flood this nation, this congregation once again in Jesus' name. Amen. Pentecostal people are people of compassion. Don't tell me you're Pentecostal if you have no compassion. Also, Pentecostal people pray. In our text, verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. Do you have an hour of prayer? 
Pentecostal people have a love for prayer. It's not I have to pray, but you mean you mean I I get to pray? You mean I can personally speak to God every day? Wow. At an hour of prayer. Prayer becomes like breathing to Pentecostal people. We love to pray. The privilege to pray. Prayer is a part of our life. It's a part of our schedule. Your family should know at a certain hour and certain times, where's dad, where's mom? Oh, they always pray it right now. At the hour of prayer, they were going to the house of God to pray. Is that you? Do you have a time when you go to the house of God to pray? Time dedicated to prayer. Not talking about prayer just when you're desperate. I prayed a couple of prayers when I was a sinner. Locked up. You have a tendency to pray. Amen. You're in some kind of motorcycle accident or your, your body parts or your blood's on the asphalt. Uh, all of a sudden, maybe I better pray. Amen. But we're not talking about, we're talking about here, Peter and John, it's at the hour of prayer when you're filled with the Spirit of God. Prayer is not just when you're in need and there's nothing wrong with that. But the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's nature creates an urgency when it comes to prayer. Part of the purpose of the Holy Spirit is intercessory prayer. This means there's a communication with the Father by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. They can't be articulated. The Holy Spirit, in other words, connects us to God in the language of the Spirit. Jude 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, uh, praying in the Holy Spirit. Is that you? Is that me? You have a time. You have a time, an hour of prayer. Do you have that? You have an hour. Most of you have hours when you go to work. Most of you have hours when you eat. Some of you have hours you're dedicated to some kind of gym or some kind of exercise. And, and you set this aside. This is an hour. What about an hour of prayer? Praying in the Spirit. Pentecostals pray in tongues. We found this river the Bible talks about in the Spirit tongue. This refreshing, this energizing power. We love to pray because this prayer, this spirit in us, uh, it's energized when we pray and commune with God. Something begins to happen in our personality that moves us beyond just the normal. I can measure your relationship by who you talk to and who you talk about. Let me repeat that. I can measure your relationship by who you talk to and who you speak about knowing. If you knew some famous person in here who be across the board, if you knew Bill Gates, probably everybody's seen you say, hey, you, you know I know. 
church. If you, some of you, NFL, you know, Brady fans or whoever, Brady said, oh, you, you won't believe her. No, I don't. But what do you do that about Jesus? Do you do that about Jesus? I can measure your relationships by who you speak to. I watch people in church and you'll congregate and speak to people that you have a relationship with. Anybody understands marriage? One of the keys to marriage is communication. Do you speak to Jesus? This is what prayer is all about. Do you speak to Him? Do you speak about Him? This is a measuring rod of your relationship. Peter and John are on their way at the hour of prayer. Watch Peter a picture of compassion. This is the first miracle after Pentecost. Compassion creates the culture for miracles. Jesus moved with compassion and he would heal and perform miracles. Look at this man, Acts 3, 2. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which was called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered. It's possible for your surroundings to look nothing like you. The gate is beautiful, but he's a beggar. It's possible to come from a beautiful family, but your life's ugly. Amen. The gate's beautiful, but I can't walk. It's possible to be here this morning, and your life looks nothing like the surroundings. And the contrast makes it even more unbearable. The contrast makes it even more painful. Maybe you come from a beautiful Christian family. But your life's an ugly mess. This makes people run away and hide away. When their family and theirs, they look at their life and look and they run. They run to the corners of the earth. They run to drugs. They run to alcohol. They run to craziness uh, makes you want to hide. Maybe you come from a family of achievers, but you failed. Not once, but many times. Think of this man. His life has been reduced to begging, but he's sitting at one of the most beautiful gates in all of history. Your name is beggar. He doesn't even have a name in this story. But the gate's name is beautiful. We're talking 40 years. Acts 4.22 For the man was over 40 years old with asking for alms. Laying from his mother's womb. Right here is a picture of Pentecostal compassion. Think of Peter before he's cutting off ears. He's cursing, denying he even knows the Lord. But not today, not after Pentecost. I wonder how many times Peter has walked by this man in the past, maybe going to the temple. Who knows, maybe he even made some kind of remark against this man in the past. Why is he here? Somebody needs to park him somewhere else. Why is he here at the gate beautiful? You see, compassion is how you see people. The condition they're in. Acts 3, 4. Peter, fixing his eyes on him, said, look at us. 
Compassion is not afraid to make eye contact with the rejected, the broken, the ugly, the unpopular, the begging. Jesus, Luke 13, 34, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you, your children together as mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you will not believe it. Fixing is, I see you. I see you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not afraid to look you in the eye. You've got my total attention. I see the obvious. Your condition is your name. Everyone calls you the beggar at the beautiful gate. You're asking for a coin. But real compassion gives you the cure. Pentecostal people are known as the people of faith. Listen to faith speak. Pentecost will renew your faith. I wonder Peter say, let's do this again. Remember he tried this faith thing once. The storm on the Sea of Galilee. You can read it in Matthew 14. They're fearful for their lives. Jesus is passing by walking on water. He said, Lord, if it's you, can't command me to come. And Jesus said, come. Peter climbed down the boat. He walks on the water for a little bit. Too. And the Bible says the wind and the waves and the storm and fear rose up. And he began to sing. And he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And we know Jesus does save him. But Jesus says to Peter in Matthew 14, 31, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And so this is Peter's history with faith. Not the best experience. What was I thinking? I could have drowned out there. I look like a fool in front of the brothers. Pentecost will cause your faith to get back up. Let's do it again. I may have fell on my face last time, but so what? I wonder what the other disciples, you know how brothers are in the Lord. I wonder the next time they're on the Sea of Galilee. Hey, Peter, show us that water walking thing again. Today they would have had him a t shirt made. Picture this guy drowning with the caption, the water walker. He's got history. But Pentecost energized his faith that has struggled, faith that has collapsed, faith that has sunk in the past. Uh, let's do it again. Look on us, he said, look on us. The Bible says this man looked at him, expecting them to give him something. Listen, Pentecostals always have something to give. Verse 6, Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have. Give I. What I do have, I'm going to give to you. Spirit-filled people. Like Peter, he's saying silver and gold is not my goal in life. What's your goal in life? He said, I'm not running after. My aim in life is not silver and gold. I wonder if this beggar is thinking, oh man, if I just got enough silver and gold, it would change my life. How many of you think that? Oh, if I just had more money. Fix my marriage, fix my mind, fix my life, fix my world. Peter says to this man, listen to me. You're asking the wrong thing. You're 
ask me for a coin, but I want to give you the cure. Is that you? I have something to give you greater than silver and gold. I have a cure for the cause. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is the cure for the cause. Do you give what you have when you encounter needs? That's Pentecost. Pentecostal people filled with the Spirit of God. There's a compassion for the broken, the lonely, the rejected, the lame, the crushed. They speak a faith language. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I want you to rise up and walk. Hey, I've never walked. You're asking me to do something I have never done. Are you saying, Mr. Peter, I don't have to be this way? Are you saying I don't have to be carried the rest of my life to the same old place? The same old life. Peter's saying, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, 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 I'm saying to you, rise up and walk. Pentecostal people speak things you've never heard before. They speak a language, listen, the world never speaks in this language. You know what the world speaks to this man? Victim? Right. That's what the world says to this man. Then you're a victim, man. You need to hate anybody that walks. That's what the world says. The world says to this man, Peter's cruel. He has, he's cold. He doesn't love you. He doesn't. How come he would ask you to give up? Everybody knows you can't walk. You've never walked. That's what the world, listen, if you listen to the world, you'll be the same old, same old to the grave and then hell. Then hell. He said, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I've got a message of faith. You may have never, I wonder if anybody they had multitudes walk by him. It goes on to say 5,000 got saved that day. I wonder how many walked by this man. Maybe flipped a coin. But never spoke a word. Never spoke a word. Never spoke one word that carried the power of the name of Jesus. Are you Pentecostal? Are you just, you know the word, but do you live the life? Who are you speaking to tomorrow? People have never heard. Pentecostal message is you don't have to be tomorrow who you are today. The world can look at you, you can look at you. It's a language is in duty with the power of the name of Jesus. I have something to give you that's way beyond silver and gold. Ministry sees in others what they don't see in themselves. Listen to what I'm going to say. Pentecostal people see the potential while other people just see the problem. Ministry looks at potential, not perfection. This man is anything but perfect. 
But he's going to be the key to 5,000 people being saved. This man no doubt carries a lot of baggage. You can't sit there begging for decades without being scarred and tore up. Knowing people. Feeling people. Been there his whole life. Carried his whole life. What do you see when you see those kind of people? Do you see potential? But as all you see is the problem. Honestly, how many here would want to do one that way? How many wives would have allowed your husband to go see this woman in the well? She'd been married five times, and then she wouldn't, but it's not wrong. And yet Jesus saw potential. How many here would have went to the man at the tomb and gatherings, a legion of demons? And yet both of these were the key to great revival. Do you see potential? Or is all you see is the problem? That's what Martinez was telling me. He got five new couples. None of them were married. He was counseling one couple. One of them just got married. Two more are going to get married in January. Two more in month after that. He's counseling one couple and she's, she's there to mention, shut up and let me talk. <laughs> what do you see when you're counseling and the female turns to the male and says, shut up and let me talk now. <laughs> do you see potential? <laughs> or do you see problems? <laughs> That's ministry. That's ministry. Ministry looked beyond the problem and saw the potential. Ministry didn't, wasn't all about perfect. It was about potential. Hey, pastor, I can preach, but are you touching anybody? Would you decide with Peter? He cussed you out. I'm, I'm just asking. Other preachers, pastors, evangelists wouldn't be preachers, pastors. Would you? Would you decide, Peter? He rebuked you one time, remember? Yes. Lord, not so. You're, you're not going to go to the cross. You had to call him Satan. That's how intense it was. Get behind me, Satan. Would you have continued working with that guy? No. Would you see him here after Pentecost? They said, Lord. Who are you touching? Real ministry causes people to walk. Real ministry causes people to go to church and praise God. Watch this man after Peter touches him. The Bible says he took him by the right hand. He said, your problems don't put me off from touching you. Your problem doesn't cause me to pull away from you. That's ministry. That's Pentecostal. I'm not afraid to get right down in all of your problems, all of your lameness, all of your baggage and begging. Let me, let me take you by the hand. Whose hand did you hold yesterday that's in church today? Whose hand are you holding today that'll be in the house of God? Peter took him by the hand. In the name of Jesus! Listen, ministry has the ability to lift people out of their problems and live in their potential. Listen to this man, Acts 3 8. Leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the house of God, the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. 
Don't show me your talent. Show me who's walking in the house of God. Amen. Who's walking in the church. Don't show me your problem or your sermon. Show me the problem that's now praising God. The proof of Pentecost is your touch changes lives. This man, before Peter was on the streets, many here have been on the streets, he's lame, lonely, and begging. After Peter's touch, he's inside the house of God, leaping and praising and worshiping God. That's Pentecost. Isn't that you? Whose hand are you holding that desperately needs to feel your human touch? This is revival. This is a church transformed. Acts 4 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. 5,000 men were converted by this one girl and Peter's preaching. The potential living inside of this lame beggar, 5,000. Does the problem blind you to the potential? The mark of ministry is people desire to hold on to you. I want to be with you. I want to stand with you. Look at this man. Acts 3 11. Now, as the layman who was healed held on to Peter and John. Acts 4 14. Seeing the man who had been healed standing with them. Who's holding on to you? This is a mark of ministry. This is a mark of Pentecost. This is a mark of the Spirit of God. Who's holding on to you? Who wants to be near you? That has problems. Who will stand with you? That has problems. That's a mark of ministry. Who wants to be with you? Pentecostals are people of compassion. Pentecostals are people that love to pray. Pentecostals are people of faith. Their faith sees the potential, not just the Pentecostals take people by the hand. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. They lead people into the house of God. They cause people to want what you have. We cry out the name of Jesus to a world many times it's never heard that name. Is that you? Is that me? Listen, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons flee. In the name of Jesus, blind eyes are open. In the name, later they asked Peter, how did you do this? He said that the name of Jesus and the power of that name, by that name, this man who was lame walks. Listen, do you use that name again to the lonely, the broken, the beaten, the discouraged, those laid in the streets? We sang that chorus this morning. We're going to sing it again. Listen, there's power. That's not just a chorus. There's power in the name of Jesus. That's biblical. I ask you to bow your head with me this morning.
You're here in this place this morning. Listen to Jesus. Jesus give you a miracle. Simply as I possibly could, I've given you a message that's still relevant in 2020 at the close of this year. But maybe you come into this service this morning. And you may not be totally like this man. You may not be begging. But the Bible says sin will make you blind. The Bible says sin. Sin will break down your life. Sin. Sin. Sin will break down and tear down and destroy your life. But I bring good news today. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ, one prayer. One prayer can change your world forever. One prayer can change your world forever. A moment of prayer. And miracles can become yours. You can be forgiven. You can be saved. You can be changed. You can be set free. In the name of Jesus. You're here this morning. I wonder how many in this place. You say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. That's me. I'm not right with God. I'm not right with God. I'm not living for God. I'm not serving God. Lost. You lift your hand. You lift your hand. You lift your hand. I need to be saved. I need to be judged. I see a hand in the back. I see a hand over here to my right. Who else? You lift your hand with these. Who else in this I see a hand in the front. Thank you, dear, for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Who else? You lift your hand. That's me this morning. That's me. Listen, your problems doesn't put God on or us. You lift your hand. Who else? Who else? Listen, your problems certainly hide your potential. I see your hand. I bless you. Thank you for your arms. Listen, listen. But we're Pentecostal. If you knew the, the history of many of the people in this place, they make this beggar look good. They came from the streets. Others raised in the church. All of sin and fall short. Who else? You lift your hand. Anyone else? You lift your hand. I want all of those that you lifted your hand. Would you lift it up and hold it? You sincere with God. Lift your eyes and look at them. You sincere with God. Sincere with God. Sincere. I want you to get them out of your seat and come. I want you to come with you. Come. Someone's going to pray with you. Someone's going to pray with you. Someone in the back. We need someone to pray with this man. We're going to believe God for healing here in just a moment. But I want to give these a chance. I want to give these. Are you Pentecostal in life? Or simply in speech? Are you living the Pentecostal experience? I'm going to ask you to stand with me all over this building. I want to open these altars. You want to come and find a place to pray. You want to come and see God. You want to come and talk to God. You want to come and talk to God. You want to come and talk to God. To talk to God. Are you laying hands on people who desperately? Are you lifting up the name of Jesus in a world that says you're a victim? Do you believe that that name can break every chain? Are you living the Pentecostal experience? Or is it simply terminology and tongues? Peter is a picture of Pentecost. Let's listen.
that you give your life to Jesus. This is one prayer. One prayer can change your world. I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to say these words. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against God. I've done things wrong. I've rebelled against God. I've hurt other people. I've hurt myself. Lord, I've sinned. But I do believe that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, You died for my sin. You paid the price on Calvary's cross. You shed your blood, innocent blood, to break the curse of my sin and to save me. Lord, I ask you right now, forgive all of my sin. Make me a new creation. Lord, save me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and give God praise? Would you stand and give God praise?